the next laudator is Christopher Haken, and he will be speaking on uh, the work of um, Kosher Birka. Well, it's a great pleasure to be able to celebrate some of the mathematical achievements of Koshe Birkar here with you today. Birkar is being recognized for his outstanding work in Barash and algebraic geometry of complex projective varieties, and especially for his contributions to the minimal model program, which include the finite generation of the canonical ring and the existence of flips, as well as his proof of the borisov alexeyev borisov conjecture, which concerns the boundedness of final varieties with mild singularities. <clears throat> I'd like to start by saying a few words about algebraic geometry, Cauchy's subject of study. So um, algebraic geometry studies the solutions of polynomial equations. Uh, we typically consider projective varieties. So these are subsets of complex projective space that are defined by a finite set of homogeneous polynomials. If you're not familiar with uh, complex projective space, you can think of it as a natural compactification of a fine space obtained by adding a hyperplane at infinity. Typically, we would like to assume that the varieties, the geometric objects we study, are irreducible and smooth. So they don't break up into two other algebraic objects. And in, if they're smooth, then we can regard them as complex manifolds of some dimension, say, d. Now, we come to the next term uh, that describes Cauchy's work, birational algebraic geometry. So two varieties are said to be birational if they have isomorphic open subsets. Now, this is in the Zariski topology, not the analytic topology. So um, open subsets are just uh, complements of zero sets of other polynomial equations. And so two birational varieties are isomorphic outside of a subset of measure zero. And it's easy to see that two varieties are birational if and only if they have the same field of rational functions or meromorphic functions, if you prefer to think of them that way. Now, uh, one advantage of working up to birational isomorphism is that even if you started with a singular variety, uh, non-smooth variety, uh, you, by Hironaka's result, you can replace it by a smooth variety via a finite sequence of relatively well understood operations known as blow-ups which I'll uh, describe in a second. So what is a, is a blow-up? Uh, well, it's your typical example of a birational operation. And uh, let's say that we have a smooth variety x and a smooth subvariety z. Then the blow-up of x along z uh, is, you can think of it as a surgery that replaces this smooth subset z with um, a, a co-dimension one subvariety. Uh, called an exceptional divisor, and the points of the exceptional divisor correspond to all the normal dire directions uh, at points of z in x. So hopefully I have a picture. Ah, here's a picture. So the first picture is of the uh, easiest blow-up that one can think of. Here we have a picture of the affine plane, C2. Of course, I'm off by two dimensions because I, it's real four dimensions. I don't know how to draw that. And we're blowing up a point, say the origin. So the origin is being replaced by all possible tangent directions at the origin. And in fact, you see that these lines going through the origin are now separated because they have different tangent direction. This other picture is supposed to represent the blow-up of a smooth curve in a freefold. It's even harder to draw a complex freefold, so I just draw a blob. And uh, every point on the curve, as you see, is now being replaced by a line. And the line is supposed to represent the normal directions to the curve inside of the variety x. OK, so uh, in order to study um, complex projective varieties, the main tool that's typically used is the canonical line bundle. So I'd like to now describe what the canonical line bundle is. So well, as the name says, it's a line bundle, which is obtained by taking the top exterior power of the cotangent vector bundle, so the dual to the tangent bundle. Um, locally, it's pretty easy to understand what sections of this of tensor powers of this line bundle look like. They just look like, in lo local holomorphic coordinates, so they look like a holomorphic function times uh, this top exterior differential to the corresponding tensor power, of course. And in this story, uh, one of the key players is what's known as the canonical ring. So the canonical ring is a graded ring where each graded piece k 
keeps track of all the sections of the corresponding tensor power of the canonical line bundle. So each graded piece is a finite dimensional complex vector space. And this, um, this ring, each of these finite dimensional complex vector spaces, are determined uniquely by the class of the variety up to barational isomorphisms. If two smooth varieties are barational, then they have the same canonical ring. One of the uh, invariants, the numbers that you can extract from the canonical ring, is its Kodaira dimension. So that's defined as the transcendency degree of the complex number uh, of this graded ring, minus 1. And it's always an integer between minus 1 and d, where d denotes the dimension of x. And it, and, and it plays an important role in the classification of these objects. Now, why do we want to consider sections of our line bundle? Well, typically, if you study some geometric object, you need functions on it. And if you just consider holomorphic functions, since our varieties are projective, they're compact, and the only global holomorphic functions are constant, so those are not very interesting. So you have to consider uh, either meromorphic functions or sections of some line bundle. And there are not many naturally available line bundles. The only uh, real choice that you have is to consider the canonical line bundle. So that's what we do. So let's do uh, a, a few easy examples. The easiest example, of course, is complex projective space itself, in which case the la canonical line bundle corresponds to uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree minus n minus 1, where n is the dimension of the projective space. So this will not have any interesting global sections. Uh, then one can consider um, smooth hypersurfaces of degree k. So these are smooth subvarieties defined by one homogeneous polynomial of degree k. And in this case, the canonical line bundle corresponds to, uh, well, homogeneous polynomials of degree k minus n minus 1, restricted, of course, to your subvariety xk. And they, they clearly likely that they're going to be three different kinds of behavior depending whether this number is negative, zero, or positive. So um, when the, the, this number is negative, so when k is less or equal to n, then we're looking at the canonical line bundle has negative degree. So any positive tensor power of the canonical line bundle would not have interesting sections. And so the canonical ring is particularly simple. It's just one copy of the complex numbers in degree 0. And the Kodari dimension then, by definition, is minus 1. When you have degree 0, so when k is equal to n plus 1, then in each degree, the, the, ten the canonical line bundle is the trivial line bundle. So in each degree, you're just looking at constant functions. So one copy of constant functions in each degree, we get polynomial ring in one variable. And hence, the Kodari dimension is 0. And finally, when the Kodari dimension is greater or equal to n plus 2, then uh, we get something much more interesting because we have that the canonical line bundle has positive degree, and each tensor power has even more positive degree. So the number in section grows uh, like a polynomial of degree equal to the dimension. So we have maximal Kodari dimension. And in this case, we say that we have a variety of general type. Uh, another uh, well-known example is a case of dimension 1, the first interesting case of algebraic varieties. In this case, this is complex dimension 1, so topologically they're Riemann surfaces. In the subject, we call them curves. And there are three cases, right? The Kodari dimension could be minus 1, 0, 1. The case of Kodari dimension minus 1, we just get uh, projective space itself. There's only one such curve. It's the Riemann sphere topologically. And we often call these rational curves. And as before, the canonical ring is particularly simple. It's just a copy of C in degree 0. Kodari dimension is minus 1. The case of Kodari dimension 0 is the case of Riemann surfaces of genus 1. These are known as elliptic curves. You can think of them as being flat. And so the canonical line bundle is going to be trivial. So we get a, complex of the, a copy of the complex numbers in each degree. Uh, polynomial ring in one variable. Kodari dimension is 0. And there are many non-isomorphic elliptic curves. And here's, uh, there's a one-dimensional, one-parameter family of them. And uh, there it is. Now, the most interesting case is the case of most curves, curves of genus greater or equal to 2. In this case, we say that they're curves of general type. And uh, one interesting thing is that for every fixed genus, uh, g greater or equal to 2, there's a 3g minus 3 dimensional family of these curves of general type. And the degree of the canonical line bundle is positive. It's 2g minus 2. So the bigger the genus, the bigger the degree is, in fact. And so we have lots of sections of multiples of the canonical line bundle. 
And in fact, uh, it follows by an easy computation that the third tensor power, or any high tensor power, is very ample. Now, what does this mean? It just means that there are lots of sections. There are, in fact, enough sections of that tensor power, the canonical line bundle, to give you an embedding of your uh, of your curve into projective space. So the embedding is just defined. You pick a basis of the sections. You send a point on x to uh, evaluating the sections at that point. And we have enough sections to actually define an embedding. And under this embedding, the canonical line bundle corresponds to the pullback of uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree 1. And from this fact, it's easy to actually deduce that the canonical ring is finitely generated. And so maybe the, the main thing that I'd like to keep from here is that most curves, so the general curve, most curves, genus greater or equal to 2, are of general type, and that the canonical ring captures uh, all of the geometry, in this case, of your curve, because you can recover your curve from the canonical ring. OK, so here's a picture of the three flavors. But I think everybody's familiar with this picture, so I'll uh, gloss over it. Um, now, of course, the story is mostly about generalizing the, fe uh, the features of Riemann surfaces to higher dimensions. And already in dimension two, uh, interesting thing happened because the Barashian equivalence relation is no longer a trivial relation. Um, so any two smooth Barashian surfaces um, are Birational, one way uh, they can be connected by a finite sequences of blow up of smooth points. If you have two birational surfaces, after f blowing up finitely many points, you, you, you'll actually get the same surface. In dimension three, it's a bit more complicated because you may have to, uh, and higher, you may have to blow up uh, interesting higher dimensional sub varieties, not just point. Now, as I mentioned before, it, birational varieties share many common properties. For example, they have isomorphic canonical rings. They also have isomorphic fundamental groups, but they uh, may have quite different topologies. So they have many common properties, but of course, several differences. Um, this is just a schematic picture to remind you that you may have to blow up and blow down and blow up many sub-varieties uh, to generate your birational equivalence. And here's a specific example of, the of a birational map from projective space to itself. Uh, it just sends x, y, z to 1 over x, 1 over y, 1 over z. Uh, and this geometrically corresponds to blowing up the three points corresponding to the intersection of the three coordinate lines, let's call them, and then blowing down these coordinate lines on the other side. So there's a nice geometric picture of that birational transformation. OK, so one of the main goals in birational geometry is in each birational equivalence class to find a distinguished representative with good properties. In dimension two, this was achieved uh, at the beginning of the 20th century by work of the Italian school. And in dimension three, the story is much more complicated. And in fact, it took uh, about 70 years or so to, uh, to solve the problem in dimension three. And this was uh, uh, s finally solved by Mori and others. Uh, and also, they established something known as the minimum model program, which is a framework uh, for the Barashian classification of high dimensional projective varieties, and in par particular, a framework for producing this distinguished representative uh, in any Barashian equivalence class. It has not been completed in all dimensions yet, but there's been a lot of progress in recent years. So one of the main results in the subject was obtained by Birkar uh, and co-authors, and also independently by Sue. This is um, the fact that uh, in any dimension, if you have a smooth complex projective variety, in fact, a variety with mild singularities, then the canonical ring is always generate, uh, finitely generated. And this has uh, many important properties. I'll discuss some of them in a second. Uh, one of the consequences is that if you consider a variety of general type, so most varieties, the one where the Kodara dimension is as big as possible, the analog of genus greater or equal to 2 in a higher dimension, then uh, x has a canonical model and a minimal model. So I have not told you yet what the canonical model and the minimal model is, but the canonical model is going to be the distinguished representative that we were seeking. So the canonical model is defined by the canonical ring. You just essentially consider the generators and relations from this canonical ring, and that defines the canonical model. 
And when uh, your variety is of general type, this is the unique distinguished representative of the rational class that you're looking for. It has many nice properties. Uh, one property it does not have is it might actually be singular. However, the singularities are very mild. They're known as canonical singularities, and in particular, the rational singularities. So, for example, you can't tell the cohomology groups of the canonical uh, model apart from the cohomology groups of a resolution. And you know, when you're working for a working mathematician, it's really hard to tell the difference between these mild singularities and a smooth variety. Uh, one di other difference is the canonical line bundle is no longer a line bundle. It's actually a Q-line bundle, meaning that some positive tensor power becomes a line bundle. And uh, a really nice property is that the canonical line bundle is ample. So that means that under some, if I consider some appropriate tensor power, uh, there will be an embedding into projective space where I can think of this line bundle as being induced by the restriction of the corresponding line bundle of the line bundle on PN corresponding to uh, linear polynomials. So this is extremely useful in practice, and it has led to many many interesting properties, uh, solutions to interesting problems, such as uh, the fact that there exists uh, a nice projective moduli space for canonically polarized varieties and their degenerations. Um, now, the next case that one would like to consider is the case of intermediate Kodaira dimension. In this case, uh, there cannot exist a canonical model, uh, essentially by the definition of canonical model. So the next best thing that you can hope for is a minimal model. That's a model where the canonical class does not become ample, but it becomes what we say NEF. So it has some posit mild positivity properties. It intersects all curves non-negatively. Now, conjecturally, the minimal model program predicts that we can always uh, find the minimal model by a finite sequence of relatively well understood elementary uh, transformation. These are known as flips and divisorial contractions. The existence of divisorial contractions was established a long time ago, but the existence uh, of flips turns out to be a very difficult problem, which is, roughly speaking, equivalent to showing that uh, the canonical ring is finitely generated. So as a consequence of our, our result, we, sh we show that, uh, in fact, flips exist in, in the most general context that you could hope for. And then, in order to produce the minimal model, you also want to know that the sequence of operations, these flips and divisorial contraction, does not go in uh, an infinite loop. And this problem is known as the termination of flips. Uh, the fact that divisorial contractions, uh, we can only have finitely many divisorial contractions, it follows easily from some topological considerations. But termination of flips is really a difficult problem. And I would like to mention that uh, Birkard has proven some of the strongest results for this conjecture. So before I get to his result, this is a sort of a, a schematic representation of a minimal model program where I start with my variety. Uh, if it has non-negative Kodaira dimension, after performing finitely many flips and divisorial contraction, I hope to obtain the minimal model, uh, which is uh, a nice representative of the original class. Um, this is a schematic picture of a divisorial contraction. Notice that it looks very similar to blowing up a smooth sub-variety in an ambient variety. That's a typical example of a divisorial contraction. And here's an example of a flip. It's much more complicated procedure where we take a, a curve that intersects the canonical class negatively and replace it by one that intersects the canonical class positively, hence improving the situation somewhat, but it's unclear how, by how much. OK, so here's uh, Birkar's result. Uh, he proves that if we assume the non-vanishing conjecture, so the non-vanishing conjecture states that if you, look, if you look at the canonical ring of a variety which is not covered by rational curves, it's not uniruled, then it has at least one non-trivial section. So as if, if we assume this non-vanishing conjecture, which is I must say, a difficult conjecture. Then uh, he shows that certain sequences of flips, known as, as flips with scalings, terminate. So not any random sequence. You have to choose, it, uh, choose your sequence of flips carefully, but then uh, the, the procedure works. And so in particular, if x is not uniruled, it's not covered by rational curves, then these minimal models exist. So the existence of minimal models is still conjectural, but uh, there is some very strong evidence. Now, uh, maybe I will mention quickly the structure theorem that we have for uh, uniruled varieties. So when you have a uniruled variety, so these are varieties, uh, conjecturally, these are exactly the varieties of negative Kodaira dimension, then 
the finite sequence of flips and divisorial contractions cannot end up with a minimal model, and instead it ends up with something called a Mori fiber space. So a Mori fiber space is a map from your variety to a variety of smaller dimension. The dimension is smaller. This is a technical condition. The relative Picard number of it is one. Uh, the intersection of the canonical class with any contracted curve is negative. So uh, maybe I should say that the nice thing about these Mori fiber spaces is that the fibers of these fiber spaces are known as funnel varieties. They are varieties with uh, very uh, well understood and nice properties. So the defining property is that the dual to the canonical line bundle of a final variety is ample. And as I was trying to say, they're well understood. For example, we know that the fundamental group is trivial. And they play a very important role in algebraic geometry and several related subjects. So uh, this is a schematic picture of you have your unirolled varieties. It's covered by rational curves. After finally many of these flips and divisor contraction, you get to a Mori fiber space. And the fibers are these interesting final varieties. So there was one of the main open question about final varieties uh, with mild singularities. In this topic, you have to allow for terminal or canonical singularities. Uh, are they bounded? Do they belong to finitely many algebraic families? In other words, can you describe them by using finitely many parameters? And this is a very important question with uh, many important consequences. Uh, so maybe I'll skip the long list, but there's an extremely long list of results towards this conjecture, uh, including a solution in dimension two, in dimension three, for mild singularities, uh, for smooth varieties in any dimension. There's a lot of incremental progress, but it's a very difficult question. And um, um, Borisov, uh, Alexey van Borisov had some evidence uh, uh, for toric varieties and for, for surfaces with mild singularities, and they ended up making a very, the most important conjecture in the subject, known as the BAV conjecture, which claims that uh, uh, final varieties with mild singularities, with terminal singularities, or even for the experts with epsilon log terminal singularities, are bounded, belong to. Uh, depend on finally many parameters. And in recent spectacular work um, announced in 2016, Birkar solved this problem completely. He showed that the Borisov Alexev Borisov conjecture holds in full generality. And this, uh, as well as proving uh, many important technical steps, so this is, this is going to have a major impact on the field. So, um, you know, I'd like to uh, sort of. Um, I hope I've conveyed that this is an a, a, a exciting subject with uh, many uh, interesting recent results, and Kashir has play, played uh, a central role in the recent uh, results in this area, and he's been Im involved in many of the most important breakthroughs, so it's really a pleasure uh, to congratulate Kashir on his great achievements.